Welcome everyone and thank you for virtually joining us for the latest version of the Variant Effect Seminar Series. My name is Diego and I'm a member of the VEST Organizing Committee along with Stephen Airwood, Mireya Selma, Yano Budu, and Adrini D'Souza. These seminars are made possible with support and a lot of help from Lara Muffley and Alex Hopkins among several others and our sponsor, the Atlas of Variant Effects Alliance. So a big thank you to them. As a reminder, we're always on the lookout for potential speakers for future seminars. If there's anyone you'd like to see present, or if you're interested in sharing some of your own work, then feel free to submit a speaker nomination form. As usual, before starting the presentations, I just have some housekeeping items to mention. Each talk is about 20 to 25 minutes, but there should be time for some questions. Please post those questions at any time to the Zoom Q&A, and we'll read them out to the speaker at the end. If you have additional questions after the end of the seminar and you're an AVE member, feel free to visit our seminar series Slack channel for more discussion. And finally, we're posting updates on our Twitter account, so be sure to follow us there at Varian Effects. You can catch the seminar today and previous presentations that have been recorded on our affiliate CMAP YouTube channel. You don't have to worry about copying this URL. I'm gonna post all these links to the chat once we get started. All the details of this seminar series can be found on our website, including a regularly updated schedule of upcoming speakers. If you've enjoyed these seminars, then be sure to register for the Mutational Scanning Symposium, which is going to be held online and in person at the Welcome Genome Campus in the UK on July 13th and 14th. Uh, the website listed here has all the details. So just keep in mind that abstracts are due pretty soon, um, the 16th of May. And for the last housekeeping item, this is really an issue, but as a reminder, please be considerate in posting comments or questions. We expect everyone to be respectful and use welcoming and inclusive language. So without further ado, we have two excellent speakers scheduled for today's presentation. Uh, first up, Warren van Lagerenberg is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Toronto in the lab of Dr. Frederick Roth. Warren's research focuses on using multiplex assays to measure the functional impact of missense variants across human disease genes associated with neurodegenerative, immune, and metabolic disorders. The title of his talk today is Variant Effect Mapping for Acute Hepatic Porphyrias. So uh, with that, Warren, go ahead and share your screen and, and start whenever you're ready. Okay. Thanks, Diego, for that, that intro. So today's talk is about understanding missense variants for a class of porphyrias. Um, here's the heme biosynthetic pathway that's shown. And deficiency of enzymes outlined in pink, the four of them, condition their respective acute hepatic porphyria. Now, today I'll be talking about the most common of these, and that's acute intermittent porphyria, or otherwise known as AIP. And then after, if there's still time, more than likely there will be, I'll be talking about hereditary coporphyria, or HCP. Now, during an AIP attack, there's ALA, ALAS1 induction. And with HMBS deficiency, there's accumulation of the porphyrogen ALA and PPG, both of these are likely neurotoxic, and they cause a range of neurological symptoms that make diagnosis really challenging. Adding to that, biochemical diagnosis of AIP is also difficult, but it's actionable. Um, and sequencing can confirm diagnosis and has a cascading benefit. And of course, as we all know, sequence-based diagnosis is still very much limited by the difficulty of distinguish distinguishing neutral from functional variants. So we then envisioned uh, that a variant effect map could inform cl uh, clinical, structural, and functional understanding of HMBS deficiency um, and support therapeutic intervention. So for example, um, our my has recently developed an RNAi drug called gibosterin that targets uh, the first rate limiting enzyme in this pathway, LAS1. Now it goes without saying, but yeast-based functional complementation assays are a powerful tool for the evaluation of these variants. And these complementation assays are based on the classic method 
where fitness defects caused by inactivating mutations are in an endogenous yeast gene are then rescued by the human author log. So the functional effects of the human variants then are then evaluated based on the ability to rescue growth relative to the wild type allele. So here we validated the yeast-based functional complementation assay using seven different variants. And in line with expectation, we observed 50% recall. So two out of the four pathogenic failed to complement at 100% precision. So all of the non-pathogenic variants complemented. So the generator map, we use the tail-seek approach. And briefly, we do codon mutagenesis, uh, generate a destination library, and then move it into the appropriate yeast strain. We then select clones encoding a functional uh, protein by pooled competitive growth. And after this, we then, uh, using next generation sequencing, carry out something called tail seek. And this is where your allele frequencies are measured in each sequence tile um, before and after your selection. And then with our current analysis pipeline, we derive functional impact scores for every possible amino acid position. Now, before we show you any variant effect analysis for HMBS, I have to give you a bit more information about the enzyme itself. You see there's two isoforms. There's the ubiquitous or housekeeping isoform, which is 361 amino acids, and there's the erythroid. And it's shorter due to an alternative translation start codon. Now, there are differences. You see with this disease, only 3% of those diagnosed had a non-erythroid variant. And with a non-erythroid variant, they usually don't show any cutaneous symptoms. So here we've generated uh, HMBS maps. So you have the erythroid and the ubiquitous. And now the residue colors such as yellow would indicate well type um, variant. And then the substitutions that are damaging are in blue, tolerated are in your white. And red um, is basically uh, if they're above well type. And gray is if it's missing. Now that said for both these maps, we obtain high confidence functional impact scores for more than 84% of all possible amino acid substitutions. And these included 90% of all, 90% uh, of the amino acid substitutions accessible by a single nucleotide change. Now, because we saw no convincing difference visually here um, or numerically here between the maps in any segment of HMBS, we calculated a weighted average score with an estimate of measurement of error for each variant to generate a single combined map. So here's a combined map. And from here on in for most of my talk about HMBS, I'll be deferring to just the data from this map here. And before continuing, here's a quick sanity check of those maps I just shown you. So we see good separation, um, but not, not perfect, uh, between score distributions of your synonymous in gold and your nonsense variants here in blue. And this would suggest that our maps have the ability to clearly separate neutral from null-like variants. Now, these maps also recapitulate many known features about HMBS biochemistry. And this is really depicted here, um, where the functional units are aligned with their functions as well as their scores. And essentially, the main pattern is that a critical determinant of mutational tolerance is the relative distance from the active site. Um, so, positions involved in cofactor binding or assembly are intolerant to mutation, but to uh, tolerance for variants of positions which only interact with the polypyrrole was much higher. Now, the active site loop of HMBS, so residues between 56 and 76, are known to contribute to the recruitment of the substrate, so PPG, and chain elongation, shown here. And we found that generally substitutions in the soup were tolerated, but interestingly, at uh, positions 60 and 61, they're basically critical to enzyme function. So based on analysis of the known structure, we then hypothesized that a salt bridge between um, aspartate 61 and lysine 27 controls flexibility and positioning of this active site loop. Now, Shaheen from Dr. Garten's group here in Toronto used 500 nanosecond MD simulations to quantify the, relation, the relationship between formation of this salt bridge, with my cursor, um, and position of the active site loop by measuring the distance between residue pairs. And as shown here for the wild type on the right-hand side, the salt bridge was present when this closed conformation for the majority of the time, in fact, it's 70%. However, after we assessed many variants with similar results, our simulations of the variant structure showed that the distance between the salt bridge residues always increased. So here, 
the lid remains permanently in the open state for the variant uh, Sparta 61 to alanine. And when all these, these results were then considered, it suggested then to us that lysine 27 and Sparta 61 play an important role in the flexibility of the active site loop, which would impact enzyme catalysis. Now, it can be instructed to compare variance impacts on stability as opposed to overall functionality. So for example, it's been shown previously that mutations having an impact on function but not stability are more likely to be active site residues. And as expected, when comparing our MAP score shown here in black and predicted delta delta G values shown here in red, um, the profile showed decent correlation. But what did stand out to us was the impact to function, so again in black, uh, but not stability in red, to residues in positions 109 and 118. Oh, sorry, 109 and 118 to uh, 316 to 319. Now, everyone loves a movie. So again, Shahin performed MD simulations, which confirmed the previ previous suggestion that a combination of the elongating, elongating polypyrrole um, is assisted by concerted movement of the cofactor binding loop shown here uh, and the active site loop shown here as well as an insertion region. Now this insertion region up here is only found in humans and it contains the positions affecting function and not stability that I showed previously on this slide here. But interestingly, when we look just at this insertion region, so those residues are all shown here, and they generally, sorry, they generally are intolerant to variation, which is consistent with the role for this insertion region acting as a volume filling wedge that basically separates domain three from domain one and two and allows room for elongation of that polypyrrole. But we saw a strong functional impact for the set of mutations at the interfaces of domain three and domain one. This would then suggest to us that interdomain domain residue interactions help restrain the structural fluctuations um, that would otherwise reduce enzymatic activity. And Dr. Shaheen then used ME simulations to further explore the importance of interdomain residue interactions on structural dynamics. So here he chose the variant theory 319 to glutamine um, and well types in blue. Now, um, the RMSF values tend to be higher for the variants, again in red, generally across all three domains. So domain one, two, and three. Um, but we do see a significant increase for residues in the active site loop, so shown here and that insertion region shown right here. So we consider all these results with the MAP and the MD simulations, uh, it underscored basically the importance of these interdomain residue, residue interactions um, on structural dynamics. Now, HMES is also reported to function as two monomers in an asymmetric unit with a weak dimer interface. But the relationship between dimerization and the enzyme stability and activity basically remained unclear. But what was unsurprising to us is that we find core and active site residues mainly intolerant to variation. And in turn, surface residues uh, are basically tolerant. What was surprising is that the map showed that variance and dimerization interface are basically well tolerated. And this would support a previous hypothesis that HMS dimerization is not critical for its stability. We then chose a set of 61 missense variants to evaluate the variant effect prediction performance of these maps. Um, and this is, of course, in terms of the trade off between precision. So that's the fraction of variants below a given threshold score that are annotated as either pathogenic or likely pathogenic, and recall seen here on the x axis. Um, so this is the fraction of uh, variants annotated as pathogenic or likely pathogenic that are scored below the threshold. Um, but precision really depends on the proportion of pathogenic and benign variants in the reference set. So the issue is precision may not act, uh, accurately reflect the prior probability that any given clinical variant is pathogenic or benign. So to counter this or to mitigate this, we transform each empirical precision recall curve to the curves corresponding to a balanced precision first recall, where the prior is then balanced. So there's 50% probability of being pathogenic. And as you can see from here, impressively, Where's my cursor here? Yeah. Impressively, a stringent pre precision threshold. So the 90% here shown by the dotted line, the maps capture more than 86% of the pathogenic variants implicated in AIP. 
Finally, for bringing new evidence towards HMBS missense variant interpretation, we restated each variance functional impact score in terms of likelihood ratio pathogenicity, or LLRP. And those scores were calibrated to ACMG evidence strength categories. And here I'm showing that we can impressively provide new functional evidence for 83% of HMBS missense uh, VUSs reported in Clinval. Now, our collaborators in Evite, who are leaders in medical grade genetic testing, recently disclosed to us that, they're, that they observe about 10 to 15 new HMBS variants per month. Most of these are VUS. Also in the database, there are currently about 41 potential movable HMBS missense variants. And after receiving and assessing our combined MAP scores, those in Evite basically found they're able to reclassify 11% of HMBS missense variants. So, based, so they were able to essentially provide a reinterpretation for 20% of those that were movable. And most impressively was the fact that our evidence was able to affect their interpretation for about 22 patients. So that generally summarizes most of what I want to say about HMBS. It's rather quick, and if you have any questions, more than uh, willing to entertain them. I want, now I want to jump to hereditary coprophoria. Now, during hereditary coprophoria attack, or HCP, CFOX deficiency, the sixth enzyme in the pathway, results in accumulation of three neurotoxic porphyrins. You have ALA, PPG, and copro-3. And biochemical diagnosis here as well has its challenges, such as presentation with extremely rare HCP variant is actually called hypoprophoria. So sequencing has definitely become a fast first-line diagnostic tool, but like I said, that has its pitfalls, such as VUS. Not only that, in addition to these VUSs, there's this peculiar instance of atypical metal-induced responses with CPOX variants that are classified as benign. So there's two examples in the clinic so, uh, that are indicated here. In other words, what I'm trying to say is there's some putative benign variants in the presence of a heavy metal, such as mercury, that produce a, a neurotoxic porphyrin called KCP via an alternative pathway. So we sought to generate an atlas of impacts of CPOX variants now across environmental, environmental contexts um, to aid diagnosis of HCP and again, support therapeutic intervention with gyboserin. Now for scalability, we opted again for yeast-based functional complementation assay, and we validated it this time with 11 variants. And in fact, here, we saw impressively 87.5% recall. So seven out of the eight pathogenic uh, variants failed to complement at 100% precision. So all the non-pathogenic variants complemented. Now, I'm not gonna move through the entire uh, pipeline again for you, just say we use the exact same framework that I previously discussed for HMBS for our CPOX maps. And with that framework, we generated maps in the presence, so the presence of mercury and in the absence. And for both of these, we see over 80% of all possible amino acid substitutions. And this includes over 90% of substitutions that are accessible by single nucleoside change. But again, both, both these maps are highly concordant, except for two particular regions indicated here and here that showed increased uh, sensitivity to this heavy metal. In this case, for us, it was mercury. Now, for better optics, we generated a delta map. So essentially, we subtract the metal schools from those in the baseline map. And when this is done, we can see mercury dependence in other words, noticeable difference for two of the known variants, cervadine 135 to alanine and asparagine 272 to histidine. Um, as well, we also see this metal dependence for those two regions uh, that are indicated in the map. And we consider where the, or the positioning of these two regions uh, here, it basically suggests to us that there's this allosteric implication where this particular substrate preference has altered for CPOX. Other than that, I'm actually happy to report that the, the known features of CPOX biochemistry, like HMBS, are re recapitulated in both maps. So uh, essentially what you have here is the main critical determinant, again, for mutation tolerance, is the relative distance uh, from the active site. Um, so here you have recognition of the substrate, so copro-3, de decarboxylation. Most of these residues here that are involved in that are intolerant to any variation. If you have residues that are basically interacting with the substrate just to stabilize it, they're more tolerant. And then substrate uh, or reorientation retention actually undergoes two 
decarboxylation reactions, um, they're particularly uh, tolerant to variation. Um, now, you might be wondering about that previous variant of HCP I mentioned, uh, hydropoferia. Um, now, there's basically only two known positions ever associated with that disease. And out of those two, we actually are seeing that uh, we are able to detect that those positions are extremely intolerant to any variation that occurs. Having seen that, we sought, of course, to evaluate the variant effect prediction performance of the map. And again, it's in terms of trade-off between your precision and your recall. So for this map, instead, we selected 45 missense variants. And for similar reasons, we, trans we transformed the empirical precision recall curve to a corresponding curve for which the prior is balanced, again, 50% probability of being pathogenic. And after all this, a stringent precision threshold that then 90% indicated here by the dotted line, again, our map now captures about 60% of pathogenic variants that are implicated in, hydro, uh, in hereditary copoferia. Now, to provide new evidence towards CFOX sense variance interpretation, again, we determined each variance LLRP score, so the log likelihood ratio of pathogenicity. And taking those scores, we calibrated them again to ACMG evidence strength categories. And after doing all this, uh, we saw that the map provides new functional evidence for about 64% of CPOX missense VUSs reported in ClinVar. So then to conclude um, with an overview of the two projects, a quick overview rather, hopefully I've shown that systematic experimental evaluation of missense variant effects on human enzymes using this yeast model can yield clinically relevant insights that can guide personalized clinical decisions for the acute hepatic porphyria variant carriers. And with that, I'd like to thank a ton of people, but mainly uh, Fritz, of course, uh, my PI, and uh, Michael, uh, head of the University of Toronto, and Shahin, as well as uh, Dr. Desnick at Mount Sinai and the ECNAC group, who are providing us with all the variant effect data. Thank you, Warren. Great presentation. Um, now we're ready for questions. Um, if there are none, we can start with two of my own. Uh, the first one, um, do you have any intuition uh, for which genes might make most sense for doing uh, SGE with yeast versus something like cancer line cells? Can you say that again? Sorry, which genes? Might make most sense for doing uh, the SGE with yeast uh, compared to something like uh, cancer cell lines. I uh, know. I particularly think it's essay dependent. Um, I can't just call out exactly like a particular category of genes that are, are just good for yeast and not uh, anything else. Okay. <clears throat> and um, let's see if there is anything in the QA. Uh, do you, um, so I'll go with my own again. Uh, would you expect there to be some differences between a yeast and a human functional assay? That's a very interesting question and one we've actually pondered. Um, so yeah, we haven't done this in human cell lines and we don't actually expect to see very much difference um, because uh, all heme associated, uh, all and, uh, genes associated with heme virus synthesis are essential. Um, it should be pretty much well correlated between the two. Um, so yeast acts as a really good model. Mm. Okay. But this was one of the things, because we, we worked in collaboration with, uh, or who actually helped fund the project, was on, on island, and that's one of the questions that they did bring up, um, but we don't expect much difference. Okay. Of course, it's just easier to use yeast. Of course. Um, any other questions? Okay, I'll ask uh, one more. So um, <clears throat> the interaction effect between some benign variants and heavy metals was very interesting. Yeah. Uh, do you know of other cases that are known that are similar to this one and can be found in um, with the SGE experiment for other diseases? 
No, it's actually the first time we're hearing of it. And like I said, this is exceptionally rare. In fact, um, of those two variants I showed you, um, if I go back to that slide quickly, uh, hopefully you can see this. Sorry, I'm take this off. Um, yeah, so of these two variants I showed you, the only one that I've ever actually really seen in the clinic is evading 135 to alanine that's been reported. This has been, uh, sorry, uh, Spargine 272 to histamine. The evading 135 to alanine has been suspected, but never actually proven. Um, so again, this is exceptionally rare. I know of no other occurrences where this would actually uh, happen. Okay. All right, well, um, thank you again for your presentation.